Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we praise and worship you for your goodness, love, and mercy. As creator of the world, you gave us life and breath. As preserver of all life, you provide for us day by day. As redeemer of all mankind, you show us your love in Christ. We praise you that the Lord is King and his spirit has been poured into our hearts. In Christ, we join the heavenly host to praise, to worship and to adore. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, praise be to your name, O Lord Most High. Amen. Of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so that you can cover up your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. 
here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We can picture Jesus being angry, remember the way he dealt with the money changers in the temple. We can picture Jesus weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. But can we picture Jesus vomiting? That is what he says in verse 16, you make me sick. Why? Were these Christians at Laodicea teaching heresy or indulging in sexual immorality? No. Some of the other churches we've looked at uh, in chapters two and three were behaving in these ways, but Jesus is nowhere near as harsh uh, with them as he is here. The church was lukewarm. But what did Jesus mean? This passage is often misunderstood. I know your deeds, uh, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one of or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I wish you were hot or cold. When people read those words, they tend to assume that Jesus is talking about um, the inner life, the spiritual state of the believer. And they go on to argue that Jesus would rather ha have us either hot, totally committed, or even cold, totally unbelieving. But the worst state of all is to be kind of half-hearted. Now, there is certainly a danger in half-heartedness, and that may well have been going on. The spiritual temperature may well have dropped. Maybe you've heard the saying, everything in moderation, or we uh, need to get the right balance. Uh, for most things in life, that's OK. We can uh, take uh, a moderate interest in perhaps politics or in dieting or in TV or sport. But we can't be moderate Christians. Jesus is not a moderate person. Look at verse 14. He is the ruler of creation. He's unique, the source of all life. We can't be casual about following him. And if we do, we're in great peril. But notice the focus of this verse is not primarily the inward state of the believer. It's what they're doing or more accurately, what they're not doing. I know your deeds that you're neither hot nor cold. And to make that point, Jesus draws a comparison with the city's water supply. In the Lycus Valley, where Laodicea was situated, there were two other New Testament towns, Colossae and Hierapolis. Colossae enjoyed water, which was fresh and cold and therefore useful for drinking. Hierapolis had hot springs in which people would bathe for their health. It was water, which was also useful. Laodicea, however, had to draw its water from miles away by stone pipes, and this water was foul. It, it left thick carbonate deposits in the pipes, and Laodicean water had become proverbial for its obnoxious taste. The water made you feel sick. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, says Jesus. Why? Because the church was like its water. It had become useless. What was the problem? Verse 17, you say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realise that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. The church had simply really begun to mirror the city in which it was part. Laodicea was a wealthy town. As you were travelling east to, towards, say, India, you would exchange your money as you moved out of the Roman Empire's constraints. Uh, not surprisingly, it had become a major banking centre. It was devastated by an earthquake in AD 64, but had so much money in reserve that it was able to fund its own rebuilding almost immediately. It was also an important centre for manufacturing clothes, and what's more, it was an ophthalmic centre renowned for its eye salves. So Laodiceans were well catered for, wanting for nothing. They had good incomes, good clothes, good health. And the church probably benefited from being a part of such a wealthy city, but it wasn't making the most of its privileged position. So says Jesus, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. It's a, a startling declaration that Jesus would say, you make me sick. It seems so at odds, doesn't it, with the picture that we carry around in our heads of Jesus. But that's because we often are selective in what we want to hear. There are plenty of places in the gospel where Jesus uses strong words for those whose faith and actions don't match up. He criticizes the Pharisees, doesn't he? He calls them whitewashed tombs, fine on the outside, but spiritually dead inside. 
time and again he challenges hypocrisy. But Jesus does not draw attention to the religious leaders just to highlight their weakness. His point is, don't do what they do. They don't practice what they preach, but you need to make sure you do. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, Jesus puts it as starkly as this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. The Christian community at Laodicea reflected the attitude of the city in which it was based. And we can see that from verse 17 of Revelation 3. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But what's Jesus' observation? You don't realise that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Jesus is not pulling his punches. Those are devastating words. But the motivation is reform, not judgment. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Financially, the Laodicean Christians may well have been wealthy, but they needed to see that true wealth lay in trusting and being faithful to their king. The Laodicean Christians may well have had fine clothes, but they needed to be clothed with Christ. They may, may well have had access to the city's ophthalmic benefits with its eye salve, but they needed their spiritual sight restored. It isn't all over for them. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. You see, that is the purpose. That is why Jesus is being so hard. When you feel challenged or convicted by God over a particular thing in your life, it's not because God enjoys putting us down. It is to raise us up. We recognize our error and we repent, literally turn around from whatever it is that we're doing wrong and go in a different direction. And so we come to the most well-known words uh, in this section. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now, those words have been used many, many times evangelistically. You may have seen Holman Hunt's painting, The Light of the World. Jesus is portrayed as a, a rather sad figure holding a, a dim lamp to a door and the door is overgrown and it has no handle and the door is the human heart. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. He is gentle and will not force his way in. You need to invite him. Now, it's not wrong to use uh, this verse in this way, but notice the context of the verse. Firstly, this letter is not primarily addressed to individual non-Christians, but to a Christian congregation whose words and deeds are not matching up. Secondly, Jesus is not pictured in this letter as a meek and mild figure who wants to do us a favour, but as the Lord of all creation. See, the picture that John paints us is even more dramatic than that of Holman Hunt's. The congregation are gathered, perhaps about to share communion, but the very person that they have come to honour is not there. The king is outside requesting to be let in. Now, Jesus is certainly not powerless. In the previous letter to the church at Philadelphia, it was shown that Jesus has the authority to open and shut doors. But here there is patience. Jesus is not wandering around desperate for our hospitality. He is inviting us to share, to share the throne of his kingdom. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What started as a stinging rebuke and a warning to this church that they made Jesus sick and were in real danger, finishes with real encouragements. There is an invitation to freshly receive Jesus' grace, his undeserved love. There is a reminder that the rebuke is given because of that great love that he has for them. And then there is the remarkable patience that he shows in allowing them to respond, a response that will lead to a restored relationship and the promise of eternity should they accept it. As we come to this seventh and last letter, 
all of us are challenged by this same Jesus, challenged uh, not to be proud, satisfied and self-sufficient, not to be lukewarm, hypocrites by our deeds not matching our words, but instead to come to Christ with empty hands, acknowledging our weakness, accepting his invitation and then going in his strength. So let's pray together. Lord, as we uh, conclude uh, this look at these seven churches, pray, Lord, that we might learn lessons that we can apply for our own life. And particularly as we consider, as we have this church at Laodicea, pray that we might not be lukewarm, but that our deeds might match our words. Help us to come to you afresh, recognising that we don't have what is necessary uh, to put us right, but that we are uh, dependent upon you and all that you have done for us. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for us, a love which took you to the cross. And we pray, Lord, that we might live in the light of that cross as we look towards eternity with you. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Now is the time to worship Come Now is the time to give your heart Come Just as you are to worship Come Just as you are before you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? Do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us and rose again?
Do you believe and trust in God, the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we pray about international unrest. Almighty Father, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority and bring the families of the nations divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin to be subject to his just and gentle rule through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, we pray for the refugee crisis. Heavenly Father, you are the source of all goodness, generosity and love. We thank you for opening the hearts of many to those who are fleeing for their lives. Help us now to open our arms in welcome and to reach out our hands in support that the desperate may find new hope and lives torn apart be restored. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who fled persecution at his birth and at his last triumphed over death. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the charities that we support here at St Nicholas. We pray particularly for the work of Tear Fund, the Leprosy Mission and the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. We also thank you, Lord, for uh, the local charities of the Food Bank and Listening Ear. We pray, Lord, that each of these charities uh, may be able to reach uh, those that they are working with. Lord, we pray for Christians that they may share your good news, that people may be made whole in mind, body and spirit. And we ask this in your name. Amen. And we just have a few moments silence as we bring before God any particular current concerns or situations that we might wish to pray for. We ask all of these things in the name and for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we join in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
final blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.